it's cold. It's cold. We're back in the car because it's cold. The way we do this in the mornings is we always go, where do you want to go? Very seldom. Very seldom. Not, uh, I, I would go 40%. 40% of the time we're like, this is where we're going. But 60% of the time we think we're just kind of like, where to today? What are you feeling this morning? And that's where we end up. But uh, today we started out and kind of looked at you and you were like, it's cold. I said, it's cold. It feels like a car morning. No, it feels like a car morning because this is the morning where we really want to make sure that we get a chance to go all throughout Marana. And that becomes uh, becomes important for where we're headed because like I told you, uh, like we started last week, last week we were headed for Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. That's where we were headed. And then about halfway through the message, it was like the Spirit of God got in there and stopped and said, you know what, no. This is what we're going to talk about. This is what we're going to talk about. Because what we're going to talk about today, quite frankly, means nothing without what we talked about last week. I would compare it to, um, I think, one of the best Christmas movies of all time. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. But I would compare it to Clark Griswold doing all that work, putting all the lights on the house untangling all the knots of the Christmas trees, you know, enduring all of the death-defying things that he endured, all that work. But if all that work is not connected to a power source, it's like him just trying to plug it in and get, get the whole thing to turn on, but having absolutely no luck because of it, because it's not connected to a power source. What we're going to talk about today, and quite frankly, going forward is the exact same. If we aren't connected to a power source, if we're not connected to the power source, and all of the work, all of the steps of faith, everything that we do, quite frankly, is pointless. And that's just really why I believe that God was like, we, we need to focus on, on His Spirit, on the Holy Spirit. Because every decision that we make must be attached to the direction that we get from Him. Because quite frankly, that's, that's why we're here. That's why any church, I believe, any church and anything that we do, any, any anything that we do as a group of believers, wherever a group of believers may be, that's that's why we do what we do. All the decisions, steps that we take have to come from the direction that God gives. Think about where we're at. You know, we're here. I mean, if somebody, if, if somebody says, you know, where do you live? We're going to say Tucson. You know, but we're actually within a, a town inside of Tucson. It's, it's Marana and we meet with people in a place or in a building at least that we call vision and that's what we're here to do we're here to connect people with not with us but with the presence of God we were just talking about the detail that, that, that the, the, the more as just as the sun's coming up the more the sun comes up the more that more detail becomes available to see and we're here to connect people with the Creator because the closer they get to God, the more detail they can see. Therefore, the more the more clear their next step can be, the more direction they can take from the left. Way. And we're here to do the same thing in on, in this place, in this corner of the world. We're here to do the exact same thing that Jesus set out to do in our text today. Like I said, we're going to be in the Book of Luke. You got your Bible with you. Luke chapter 4, finally made it to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and we are going to be in verses 14 through 21, starting in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, man, that's important, why was he there, it was in the power of the Spirit, not because he was homesick, it's because he was in the power of the Spirit. And news spread about him through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth. Okay, so he returned to Galilee. That's the city. He went to Nazareth. That's the town. The town where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So he returned to the city, went to the town, and went into the synagogue, into the place, right? We're here in the city, in the town, and we get the opportunity to go to a place that God's positioned us to be. 
At the end of verse 16, it says he stood up to read. And when or in the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Verse 18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It says, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant sat down. And I love that, that imagery, that picture of here he's got this scroll and he just closes it up, hands it back. Because now you can feel the room saturating, maybe, maybe with tension, maybe with wonder, with curiosity. Because you, you know that sound when you're, when you're done? It just kind of pulls you in a little bit. And he hands it back to the attendant. And I love the detail that the Bible gives because it says the eyes, not of some, not of those who were there to get a word, not of those who knew Jesus, not of those who even wanted to attack Jesus. It says the eyes of everyone in the synagogue weren't just fixed on, they were fastened on him. You know how when you fasten something, like when you, fa like when you really, like, like I, first thing I had was like, you're using a socket, like you are, I'm going to make sure that this thing, I mean, their, their eyes are stuck on him. They are stuck on him. They're fastened on him. Verse 21, he began saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now I want to call our attention back to verse 19. Everything that we just read. I want to go back to verse 19 for two reasons. Number one, it's my title. But number two, I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question. Because we go, we go back to verse 19. Verse 19 reads, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the title of the message. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But I want to ask a question. Jesus is reading, right? Doesn't seem like he gets very far. He just closes it up and he stops. And the question that I had was, why did Jesus stop there? Of all the place, why did he stop there? That's what I want to try to answer with the rest of our time today. But to do that, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you. As we sit and we dive into this word, we dive into this message, and we take the time to unpack it, I pray that you reveal to us exactly why Jesus stopped where he did. More importantly, I, I pray that the reason that, when you reveal to us the reason that Jesus stopped where he did, it, it, it illuminates the reason why we're here in the corner of the earth that you place us in and the time period in which we're here. Just as the light is continuing to come up, over the horizon, I pray that it continues to illuminate in our hearts, because the more it illuminates in our heart, the more of what you want to do will flow from you to us, and then through us, so that the people around us can connect with you, because that's really the reason we do this, is to connect people to you. So again, Father, I thank you for today, I thank you for this time, I thank you for this word, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, you and I go back and forth and we talk about this uh, little problem I got, little problem. Little problem with me being a little, what's, what's the phrase? Uh, I don't know when to shut up. <laughs> we'll just say it that way. Belabor the point a little bit. I don't mean to, man. I don't mean to. But dude, when I read scripture, like this is not just a book to me, man. When I read it, I try to put myself in it. Like I try to sit there and, and, and envision everything that they were doing, everything that was going on at the time. Like I want to see it. Everything. I mean, I, what were they? What were? What were they seeing? What were they feeling? What was the? What was the atmosphere of the room? What was the tension that, in the room? What was the? 
the tone of the of, of, of the speaker. What was I try to get and get into every single detail, and I'm, I, I got real fixated on everyone in the room is looking at him like you can feel it like and I don't know why I mean because I know it's a scroll and a scroll doesn't close like a bible does but I just that's the picture I have in my head of Jesus just sitting in there and maybe the the walls are a little bit echoey because you know they're not insulated and I I just I just picture this that sound right and nothing but but silence follows it and I just I can even picture people leaning forward I can just picture that Right. And then there's that awkward transition between Jesus handing the Bible back to the attendant. Everybody's like, what's he going to say? And the reason that I think there was some tension in the room or some curiosity or as, as the as, as the text says, the reason that everyone's eyes were, were fastened on him. is because this was not the first time that they'd heard this text in Isaiah, because whether you know it or not, what Jesus was reading to them from Isaiah is something that they were very familiar with, something that they would have heard before. And being that they're familiar with it, they would have known there was more to what Jesus was reading. They would have known that, that they would have known that, I, I want to say that they would have known that Jesus was reading Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, because if you look in your Bible, what Jesus read in Luke 4, 18 and 19, is actually a callback to Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. And technically he's not even reading verses or verses 1 and 2 of chapter 61 because in his time there was no there was no chapter 61 there was no verses 1 and 2 it was just the text in and of itself. Uh, chapters and verses are something that, that man has added later on to make the, the text he's more easily identifiable. So they didn't have verses and in, in, in chapter numbers back then the way that we have them today. But the point I'm trying to make still very much is valid because this is something that they were familiar with. They knew that there was more to this text. They knew that there was more to what Jesus was saying because what Jesus what Jesus read is actually, like I said, from Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61, starting in verse 1, says, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. That's the end of verse 1. Verse 2 says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that's where Jesus stopped reading in our text. But verse 2 continues and says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Jesus stopped before reading a, a word to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He stopped there, but the text continues and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Similarity between Greek and, in, Greek and English. In English, we don't start sentences with the word and. Same, same is true in Greek. We do not start sentences. It's an incomplete thought. And what? There has to be, you, know, you, you can't marry a thought in one sentence without tying it back to a, the original thought. We don't start sentences with the word and. So why did Jesus stop where he did? That was the thing that really got my attention. Why would he stop halfway through the thought? I mean, he could have stopped anywhere in that text. And I think this, the, the, the shock factor would have been there. This isn't just shock factor. It's shock factor in curiosity. I mean, if he would have stopped at the end of verse 1, the same shock factor would have been there. He could have stopped right there at the end of verse 1. He could have sat there and said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That in and of itself would have created a shock factor. He could have continued the point all the, and read all the way through verse 3 and accomplished the same thing. He even could have finished verse 2. He could have stopped at the end of verse 1, verse 2, or verse 3 to accomplish the same shock factor, but he didn't. He stopped halfway through verse 2, halfway through the thought. Why? 
You ever started something and stopped halfway through? There's one thing that I started that I stopped halfway through. On the surface, I have to tell you that it's stupid. I have to. He knows what it is. I have to tell you on the surface that it's stupid. The reason I have to tell you that is because I'm 37 years old. Low key, I really think this is cool. But quite frankly, I'm too old to think that this is cool. And so I have to tell you that it's 30, that, or that, that it's stupid. But even me at 37 years old, I actually think it's really cool. But three, three and a half, four years ago, I got the, the, the random idea that for Halloween, I wanted to dress up as none other than the Green Ranger. I wanted to be the Green Ranger. And I didn't want that cheap eBay costume. No. I wanted the helmet. I wanted it's a suit. He's shaking his hand going, dude, it's green spandex. No. No. It's not an overdone yoga pants, okay? It is a suit. And they're not gloves. They're gauntlets. And I got the helmet. And I got the suit. And I got the helmet. And the morpher's coming. All right? The morpher's in the mail. Don't have the belt. I don't have the boots. I got the stuff to make the shield. I haven't made it yet. I might. I don't know. I'm doing it this year. I'm going to be the Green Ranger. And I, I had momentum, man. I don't know why, but like a year ago, a year and a half ago, I just stopped. I just stopped halfway through. We stop halfway through things. Pick your thing. If you're people restoring a vehicle, right, you get the idea and the inspiration to start restoring a vehicle, and then you just kind of stop. You know, uh, uh, I'm going to get the year-long gym membership, and this is the day. And, and you know what? For like three weeks, you go hard. And then you just stop. I'm going to eat right. And then a week in, you're just like, not anymore. I mean, just halfway. I'm going to go back to school and get my degree. And, and, you know, you take a handful of classes and then you just, you just stop. You know how many books I've started to read? I'm halfway. It's like, I'm, I'm like three books. I'm halfway through. There's so many things. I mean, we start them and, and, and we just stop halfway. And I'm just wondering, why did Jesus stop halfway through? Why did he stop halfway through? I kept reading the sentence that he stopped on. That was the thing that fixated on me, right? I mean, it was it was pinpoint. It was, I mean, he had that, that text. That te- where he stopped was in his sights. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Proclaim the year. I kept reading it. Proclaim. I've seen that verse. I've seen that verse phrase. I've, I've, I've been through this book and, I, and this isn't the only place that that phrase, you know, of the Lord's favor, year of the Lord's, it's said kind of different, but of the Lord's favor, you know, of the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's favor. It's, I've seen it in other places. I've even heard it preached before. I've heard it and some, I gotta be careful because I don't want, I don't want to, I've heard it preached a handful of times, and sometimes the way that I've heard it preached, I haven't quite liked it. Not be, it, I felt like it was used, you know, this is the year of the Lord's favor. I felt like it was motivational nonsense. Um, this is the year that the good Lord, this 2023 is the year of the Lord's favor. The good Lord is going to give you a blessing this year. This is the year the kids come home. This is the year that you get uh, you get a good diagnosis. This is the year that God blesses your bank account. This is the year the Lord's favor. 2023. Say amen, somebody. I just, I'm like, it's not motivational mumbo jumbo. It's not, it's not what it's for. Because if you look, if you look at the context in which the phrase is used, and I wrote a couple of them down, you can go back. We're in, we, you know, we, we, were, we, we went back to Isaiah 61. Luke, Luke 4 is a quote of Isaiah 61 where that phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, is used. But if you, go to, if you go earlier in Isaiah, Isaiah 49, 8, the first half of that verse, it says this is what the Lord says. In, uh, and he uses this phrase, time of my favor. I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. 
If you're looking for a verse to write down, write down that one. If you're looking for something to pray and a call back to God and the promises that God has made, that's, that's a good one to write down. We'll talk about why in a minute. Uh, but Psalm 69, verse 13. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, oh God, <laughs> answer me with your sure salvation. But that's just, those are Old Testament verses. It's not just the Old Testament where you'll find this phrase. You can find the New Testament too. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now, bro, humor me and shout now. Damn. I tell you now, now is the time of God's favor. Now. Today, now is the time of the Lord, of, or now is the day of salvation. Now it's tricky because one says year, one says time. Now I'm throwing the word day in there. Which, which one is it? Which one is it? Second Peter 3 8 might help us out with this. Second Peter 3 8 says, But do not forget this one thing. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord. A day is like, like, emphasis on like, that's important. A day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like, not are, just are like a day. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because some people have tried to utilize that, that, that out of context to um, twist creation a little bit. You know, in the beginning, God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, trying to say that each day is a thousand years. Now, if you read this, if you read 2 Peter 3, 8 in the context, if you read it in the context of 2 Peter chapter 3, the entirety of the whole chapter, and realistically in the entirety of 2 Peter, the focus isn't creation. It's not talking about creation. It's speaking about something that's significantly more important. This entire chapter, 2 Peter 3, is talking about the patience of God. Gosh, that's awesome. Man, that's rich. But it's talking about the patience of God. The patience of God that he exists towards mankind, his beloved creation. The patience that he's exhibiting towards mankind today. The reason we're driving around, the reason that we really felt that doing the pre-record, trying to pick one corner of Miranda, we said, let's, aside from the fact that it's cold, Maybe this is why we justified it in our head, but nonetheless, the point still holds true. Is when we drive around, we get a chance to really trace the entire town. We can go all throughout the town of Miranda or the corner that he's placed us in. And we're really fortunate to live in the place that we live in. There's beauty in it, whether it's the sunrise, whether it's mountain ranges that no one else really in the, on the planet gets to see. We're, we're really fortunate to live where we live and be where we are and, and everything that we pass, every store that we pass, every car that passes us, every complex that we pass, our neighborhood that we drive through, everywhere, place that you work. God desires every single person in every single corner of the earth. His desire is for all of them, every single person, every man, every woman, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to come to a knowledge of of his son. His son is the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. He desires every man and every woman in every single corner to come to a knowledge of the truth. And this is our corner. Marana, Arizona is our corner. There's other corners, but this one's ours. This is our corner. This is the one that we're in. This is the one that we've been fortunate enough to be a part of. And I think it's important that we see the purpose in that that we see the placement in that, that we stop viewing it as an accident. Because otherwise we'll treat this corner as nothing more than just an accident. This is just kind of where we are. Who cares? I was born here, I live here, I die here, and there ain't nothing special about it. No, there's a lot. There's... That may not be in our eyes. We may not view it special in our eyes, but it's special in the eyes of God, so much so that he's patiently, patiently preserving this place in this time period because it's precious. But we're not gonna we're not gonna see that if we don't read Second Peter three in the full context because, like I said, this this is about this chapter is about the patience of God. 
And we're going to read it in its context, starting in verse 3. 2 Peter 3.3 3 says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will, will come. And what are they going to do? <laughs> They'll be scoffing and following their own evil desires. They won't be following the Lord. They won't be following God. They'll be following their own evil desires. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be disciplined and I'm not going to unpack that anymore. But it just says, Pete, well, crap. It just says people. It doesn't say what types of people. Because we immediately label the people in our heads, right? People who go to church, people who don't. Well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's people in the church <laughs> following their own desires too. I'm going to leave that alone. Verse 4, they will say, where is this coming he promised? I mean, ever since our ancestors died, I mean, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. The sun continues to come up and rise and set. That mountain has that mountain range hasn't changed in 300 years. And you know what? I hear I hear you I hear what you're saying. The Lord's coming back, but sun goes up, sun comes down. Sun goes up, sun comes down. I mean, over and over and over. where's this coming that you speak of? It says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by what? By God's word. Long ago, by God's word. This weekend, we're giving an offering. We're challenging everybody. Even today, we're challenging you to give an offering. And at the end, afterwards, we're going to hand everybody one of these. It's coming up on your screen. And the purpose of this is so that you can choose a word in 2023. And the reason that we want you to choose a word is because a word from God is powerful. And people deliberately forget that long ago at the beginning of creation, by God's word, not by lucky hap happen chance circumstances, by God's word, God spoke creation into existence and it was there. All it took was a word. By God's word. A word from God is very powerful because a word from God, by a word from God, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed. And it says, out of water and by water. That's weird. That sounds funky. Out of water, it kind of makes sense, but by water makes no sense. But you remember, remember a couple weeks ago, well, actually about months ago now, the pre-record, we got lucky, timed that up. We were talking about uh, John 7. Jesus was, 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 was talking and John's quoting him and talking about, about living water. Jesus says, if you, know, if, if you knew who you were talking to, um, you would ask for a drink and he would give you living water. And then John puts out there in verse 39, he puts it in parentheses and he says, uh, by living water, he was referring to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Who is living water? Living water is the Holy Spirit. Understanding that in the context of Genesis chapter 1, verse too, because remember it said it said was formed out of water by water. So understanding that the Holy Spirit is living water, read you know, with, with that, take that understanding to, to Genesis 1 2. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the Spirit of God, living water, was hovering over the waters. Now all of a sudden it makes sense when you read it in the context of 2 Peter 3 5. The heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water by water. Get kind of tracking, following along. And the reason I highlight that is because we skip over that. Oh, yeah, that's cool. No, 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 no. It's way, it's, it's cooler than you think because that means that the same spirit that created the stinking universe is coursing through your veins and my veins and your veins if you've given your life to him. I, that sentence is the reason I believe God was like, stop where we stop. We need to digest what we, what we talked about last week. If you missed that message, go back and check it. Go back and check last week's message. Because if the same power that created the universe is coursing through our veins, if we've given our life to him, and all we have to do is fan it into flame, 2 Timothy 1, 6. And how do you fan it into flame? We've talked about this. You pray, you praise, you worship. That's why Wednesday, at least for us in our context, is so important. Uh, and that's why I've, 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 I've told people in our church, I don't care what you, Wednesday is when our worship team gets together and, uh, and we rehearse. And I've told them, I said, listen, I don't care what you call it. Actually, it's not true. I do care. But I made certain uh, one thing we will not call it is we will not call Wednesday. We will not call it band practice. 
you walk in here, do not call it band practice. Do not. Why? What's, what's, your, big, what's your big deal with you? Because if you call it band practice, well, then it's on the same level as soccer practice and basketball practice, and yoga practice, and this meeting and that meeting. and mm -mm. It's not. That's why we don't call it band practice. I love Joey. He goes, let's call it WWV. I was like, what's WWV? Wednesday Worship and Vision. And I was like, and it sticks now. So now we call it WWV. Wednesday Worship and Vision at 630. You're invited. You are invited. And worship is important. It's not a, man, stop viewing it as a, a, as a performance. I've said it all the time, man. Worship is not a performance, it's a posture. And where I get that from is Psalm 96. Verses one and two, where, where three times in two verses it says, sing, sing where? Sing to the Lord. And that's the tension. That's the difference. If it's a performance, you're not singing to the Lord. You're singing to people. But when it's a posture, you're singing to the Lord. And quite frankly, you don't care if there's people around or not. You're fixated on him. And that's what we do Wednesday. That's what I tell everybody we come in. Hey, we're not singing to people and performing to them. That's why I always say no guitar solos. Not a, let's play a song as a good guitar solo. Let's definitely not play it because then it's fixated on you. And you play your guitar solo, everybody goes, woo And you get a big old grin on your face, and nobody's thinking about Christ. It's not a performance, it's a posture. It's a posture. A posture where you're singing to the Lord. That's what we do on Wednesday nights, and that's why we're inviting everybody. We love to get together corporately together and not just have a prayer team important don't get me wrong but we want to pray together corporately we want to pray for one another we want to commit to that a minimum once a week that's why once a week we get together as a church and pray that's why once a week we give our church the opportunity to come together and worship i'm doing everything in my power everything in my power to stir your spirit because marana needs it marana needs it marana needs us to be obedient to the power that's coursing through our veins so that we can connect people to the light that is Jesus Christ. Because 2 Peter 3, 6 says, by these waters that created the universe, by these waters also, the world of that time, not this time, that time, now that's a different. What's the, what's, what's the separation point? The world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Okay, well, I only know of one time in scripture where the world was destroyed. And preserved, the mankind was preserved through eight people. And it was the flood. God destroyed, he created the universe by water and destroyed, or sorry, he created the world by father, by, by water and destroyed it by water, but yet preserved this time through eight people. He made way for this time through eight people after the flood. And then we read in verse seven, by the same word, the same word that created the earth, the same word that destroyed the earth the first time, that same word, by the same word, the present heavens, this time, the time that we're in now, the present heavens and the present earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of who? The ungodly. And within this context, 2 Peter 3.8 explains that, that God is not slow in, in concerning his promise. He's not slow in it. He's patiently, patiently waiting, patiently waiting for mankind to be saved. All of mankind, every man, every woman, in every single corner. And the reason I want to highlight all of this is so that when we look back at this phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, I pray that we understand it in its proper context, that, that when it says the year of the Lord's favor, it's not talking about a literal 365-day year. The year of the Lord's favor is not just one particular year, and we're trying to guess which year is it. No, 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 no. The year of the Lord's favor, it's a period of time. A period of time known as the day of salvation. And it's the time period that you and I are living in. 
today in this corner of the earth that God's positioned us in, in this period of time that we've been placed in. We're in the day of salvation. And this this time period that's been going on for the last 2,000 years, is, is you can really characterize it by three, three of God's qualities. I mean, it's His grace, His redemption, and His deliverance. The reason that Jesus stopped where He did when He was reading in Luke 19, Luke 4, 19, the reason He stopped where He did is the same exact reason that we have to double it here in 2023. Because Jesus stopped before reading the phrase, the day of vengeance of our God. And the reason that he stopped before that time, or before that phrase, because that time period hasn't come yet. The day of vengeance is coming. But as 2 Corinthians, yes, our 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, while the day of judgment is coming, the day of salvation is now. God wants every single corner of the earth every stinking corner of the earth to come to a knowledge of his son, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to come to a knowledge of Jesus. Doggone it. Guys, this is our corner. This right here. Miranda is not going to know the Lord if we keep doing the same stuff that we've always been doing. If we keep trying to do it the same way that we've been doing it year after year, day after day, they're not going to know the Lord. And that's not on these people. That's on us. That's on us because we've chose, chosen comfort over Christ. We've chosen convenience over Christ. God is choosing creation and we're choosing comfort. And that's not their fault. That's our fault. That's our fault. Guys, if, if things don't change, people won't change. That's why the Lord, the, the word that the Lord put on me this year and the word that I'm writing down that I'm going to place where I can see it is the word now. Why? Because now is the time of the Lord's favor. Now is the day of salvation. I, you and I have been talking for a long time. I'm like, man, Pastor Stephen has, Pastor Stephen Furtick has that, I love that phrase, audacious faith. And Michael Todd has crazy faith. And it, that's a, God, those are cool words. And it was like, God hit me in the moment. No, it's like 2020, like, like, like forget 2023, it's now. 2023 is soon, but it's now. Looking for some now faith. What about some now faith? You gotta, it's time for now faith. When do you follow me now? Follow me, wait, now? Andrew's talking about Luke 9, 58 through 62 the other day. Context of that conversation, now, now. We're not kicking cans anymore, man. We've been kicking cans for years. We ain't kicking cans down the road, no. Now. What's God, whatever God's calling us, we're doing it now. Now. We've been praying and now is the time to take the step of faith that we've been talking about. It's time to double it now. Miranda needs to know. And that's why we're bringing an offering to the Lord. We're going to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit has been impressing upon us. Remember, we talked about Ephesians 5, 18 last week. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, he will influence you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Allow the Holy Spirit to control you. Just close your eyes right now. Allow the Holy Spirit to control you. Allow him to influence you. Allow him to influence you to do what you normally wouldn't. Be obedient to what he's telling you. Even if it feels uncomfortable, be obedient to what he's telling you. Because generation after generation, God has shown generation after generation that he's never going to let you down. He's never going to let you down. Never has, never, never will. Now, if you're new, if you're brand new, if this is like the first time you've seen this, no obligation. Certainly an opportunity. Certainly an opportunity if the Lord's stirring your heart right now. Don't feel like you're excluded, but certainly no obligation. It's brand new. It's the first time you stumbled on this. But if you're not, if you're bought into, if Vision Church is your home church, and you're bought into what's going in at Vision, bought in means that you're regularly 
regularly attending. Maybe you're bought into the people at Vision Church. It's time. It's time. It's time to take that step of faith. You'll have the opportunity to do that right now. There's a QR code that's popped up on your screen. Scan it with your phone if you're like, I'm watching my phone. Go down to the description box because there's a link. Click on it. It's going to take you right to a place where you can participate in the doublet offering. If you're looking for a block, a place to write your word, and if you watch these regularly but don't attend because it's too far for you to drive because you live in another state, reach out to us. There's a link in the description box. Request a block. We'll send it to you. We'll mail it to you. Not eventually. We'll do it now. Because now is the time to take the step of faith. Because we're in the day of salvation and God is patiently preserving this time and this place from the day of judgment. The best time to start was yesterday. The second best time to start is now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you stir every single person who hears this message to be obedient now. Take the step of faith now. Connect with you now. So that you can work in and through us to reach whomever you've positioned us to reach. For the benefit of somebody coming into a relationship, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. If this is your moment, if now is your moment, repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I believe he died, that I may be forgiven and rose again, that I may have life. I receive this new life. This is my new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. You just prayed that. Also connect with us. So we want to come alongside of you. God's not waiting for you to get it all figured out. When did he choose you? Now. Why did he choose you? To reach people. When? Now. Ultimately, all of this is designed to bring us as, us as brothers and sisters and as God's children closer to him. Have more of his goodness revealed to us. And my prayer is that every single man, woman, and child in every single corner of the earth continues to draw closer to him because the closer that people get to him, the more that his presence will reveal about why he chose you. So again, Father, again, guys, thank you so much. I thank you so much for taking the time to listen to these messages. I thank you in advance for the step of faith that you're going to take. I cannot wait to hear and see what God does in and through you. But as always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this message. I pray that you have an amazing week, and we will see you next time. Love y'all.